So Elon Musk was on the All In podcast at the conference talking about AI, among some other things. He covered a wide range of uh, topics from politics to free speech to if Saturday Night Live is in fact live or not and his uh, strange way of testing that. But there's about 12, 13 minutes where they talk about AI and sort of humanity's future when it comes to AI, robotics, etc. Are you chasing the next AI unicorn? Subscribe so it doesn't end up chasing you. Let's take a look at some of the most important things that he said. First and foremost, he's asked how he sees AI development going. Will the investors see an ROI and in their investment into AI? Why is NVIDIA the only company that's really making money off of this AI boom? Here's what Elon had to say. The spending on AI probably runs ahead of, I mean, it does run ahead of the revenue right now. That's, there's no question about that. Um, but the rate of improvement of AI is faster than any technology I've ever seen by far. And and, and it, it's, I mean, like, the, 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 for example, a Turing test used to be a thing. Now, you, you know, your basic uh, open source random LLM, you're writing on a friggin' Raspberry Pi probably <laughs> could, uh, you know, beat the Turing test. Um, so there's, I, I, I think actually, like, like the, the, the good future of AI is one of immense prosperity where there is an age of abundance, no shortage of goods and services. Everyone can have whatever they want unless except for things we artificially define to be scarce, like some special artwork. Um, but anything that is a manufactured good or provided service uh, will, I think, with the advent of AI plus robotics, that the cost of goods and services will be, will, will trend to zero. Like, it'll, it'll be, I'm not saying it'll be actually zero, but it'll be, every, everyone will be able to have anything they want. Uh, that's, that's the good future. Of course, you know, in, in my view, that's probably 80% likely. So look on the bright side. I'll leave 20%. Twenty percent probably of annihilation. Nothing. What are you gonna do? Like, what does that look like? Oh man. I mean, frankly, I do have to go engage in some degree of, of deliberate suspension of disbelief with respect to AI <laughs> in order to sleep well, um, and even then, um, because I, I I think the actual issue, the, mo the most likely issue, is like, well, how do we find meaning in a world where AI can do everything we can do, but better? That that is that is perhaps the bigger challenge. Um, although you know, at this point, I know more and more people who are retired, and they seem to enjoy that life. So, uh, but I think that that may be maybe, maybe there'll be some crisis of meaning, like it, because the computer can do everything you can do, but better. So may, maybe that'll be a challenge. But but really, you know, you, you need you need the sort of end effectors. You need the the autonomous cars, and you need the sort of humanoid robots or you know, general purpose robots. But once you have general purpose humanoid robots and autonomous vehicles. Uh, you really, you, you, you can build anything. Um, and and, and this, this, I think that there's no actual limit to the size of the economy. I mean, there's obviously you know, the massive earth, you know, like that will be a lot, one limit. Um, but the, you know, the, the economy is, is really just the average productivity per person times number of people. That's the economy. And if you've, if you've got humanoid robots that can do, you know, where there's no real limit on the number of humanoid robots, um, and, and that they, they can operate very intelligently, then, then there's no actual limit to the economy. There's no meaningful limit to the economy. This is a very interesting point. He's made it before, basically how we define the economy and prosperity, the national sort of output of countries. A lot of it is tied to, you know, the human labor force, the amount of people, that are willing and capable to do work to create some sort of value. With AI, with robotics, all of a sudden, there's like this whole new sort of a wild card in the equation. If computers can do everything a little bit better than we can do, and if robots can take care of a lot of the manual labor, the production, etc., especially once you start thinking about robots manufacturing other robots and how that whole thing plays out, we kind of get into uncharted waters. If you haven't heard, Elon Musk and XAI, his AI company, recently launched Colossus. Here's a piece from the information called Why Musk's AI Rivals Are Alarmed by His New GPU Cluster. So Elon Musk claims that on Monday he completed a cluster of 100,000 NVIDIA H100 chips in four months to be used to train the next models of his startup XAI, meaning Grok and other models like it. This would make it the most powerful cluster of GPUs, graphic processing units in the world. Now, some people are skeptical, of course. No other company has been able to successfully string together that many GPUs in one location. I'm not sure if he's saying if it's just one location or maybe it's distributed in some way, but rumors were that people at Microsoft, for example, complained about you know not being able to put that much compute in one location without taking down the state's 
power grid, you also have various issues with, you know, cooling and it produces a lot of heat. You have to figure out how to cool that heat to make sure nothing is uh, melted. So there's, there's a lot of issues with clustering everything in one location like that. As I mentioned here, you know, there's the power problem, right? The amount of electricity. Musk previously said the 100,000 chip cluster was up and running in late June, but at that time, a local electric utility said publicly that XAI had access to a few megawatts of power from the local grid. That's only enough power to run a few thousand GPUs people who build such clusters told me. And the local utility company was saying that they're going to start ramping up the amount of power that Elon Musk and XAI would have access to. And that by August, which is last month, right, it would have enough power to power half of that cluster. And soon after that, by 2025, it would have enough power to power all 100,000 chips. Apparently, Musk had a short-term solution, bringing in a natural gas-powered uh, turbine so next, Musk is asked about this super cluster of GPUs and what the potential upsides, what the potential problems with it is. Keep in mind that XAI is not the only sort of AI play that he has. Tesla is obviously an AI play as well. Autonomous driving, neural nets, the Optimus robots also engage in a lot of building of neural nets. It's a little bit different from large language models. This is more vision based and movement based, but still requires the same graphical processing units, GPUs from NVIDIA, etc., to train and to run inference. And again, that cluster is called the Colossus. You guys just turned on Colossus, which yeah. is like the largest private compute cluster, I guess, of GPUs anywhere. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the most powerful supercomputer of any kind. Um, which sort of speaks to what David said and kind of what Peter said, which is a lot of the kind of economic value so far of AI, AI has entirely gone to NVIDIA. But there are people with alternatives and you're actually one with an alternative. Now you have a very specific case because Dojo is really about images, large images, huge video. So um, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the Tesla problem is different from the, um, you know, the sort of LLM problem. Uh, the, the nature of the intelligence actually is actually, and, and, and the, what, what matters in the AI is, is different um, to, to the point you just made, which is that in, the, in Tesla's case, the context uh, like is very long. So we've got gigabytes of context. Gigabytes context numbers, yeah. Yeah, you've got, you know, sort of... Uh, just bringing it up. Kind of billions of tokens of context. Right. Not, not any amount of context because you've got um, seven, seven cameras and if, if you've got several, you know, let's say you've got a, a minute of several high-def high cameras, then that's gigabytes. So you, you need to compress. And so the Tesla problem is you've got to compress a gigantic context um, into the, the pixels that, are, that actually matter um, and, you know, and, and, and condense that over a time. And so you've got to, in, in both uh, the time dimension and the space dimension, you've got to compress the pixels uh, in, in space and the pixels over in time um, and, 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 then, and then have that inference done on a tiny computer, relatively speaking, a small, you know, a few hundred watts, uh, it, it's a Tesla designed uh, AI and first computer, uh, which is by the way, still the best, there, there isn't a better thing we could buy from suppliers. So the Tesla designed, uh, AI and first computer that's in the cars is better than anything we, we could buy from any supplier. Just by the way, that's kind of a, oh, by the way, not the, the, the Tesla AI trip team is extremely good. You guys, the design, there was a technical paper and there was a deck that somebody on your team from Tesla published and it was stunning to me. You designed your own transport control like layer over ethernet. You're like, ah, ethernet's not good enough for us. Yeah. You had this TT COE or something and you're like, oh, we're just gonna reinvent ethernet and like string these chips. It's pretty incredible stuff that's happening. Yeah. Um, no, the team, the, the Tesla chip design team is extremely, extremely good. Um, so. Um, but is there a world where, for example, other people over time that need, you know, some sort of like video use case or image yeah. theoretically, you know, you'd say, oh, why not? You know, I have some extra cycles over here. So we should kind of make you a competitor of NVIDIA. It's not intentionally per se, but. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, there's this training and inference. And we, we do have the, you know, two, those two projects at Tesla. We've got Dojo, which is the, the training computer. Uh, and then, um, you know, our inference chip, which is in every, every car, inference computer. Um, so, and at Dojo, we've only had Dojo 1. Dojo 2 is, um, you know, should be, we should have Dojo 2 in volume towards the end of next year. Um, and and that, that, that will be, we, we think, sort of co comparable to uh, the, the, sort of a B200 type, type system, a training system. So he talks a little bit about the need for AI chips, the inference chips, but not too many details are given. However, they do talk about the Optimus project and also how much they might cost, which is a very important factor. 
because each robot will, of course, provide some value to any given business or factory manufacturing facility. And depending on where the cost kind of lands will greatly determine the demand, right? Because if you're making a lot more money or you're saving a lot more money than the robot costs, you know, if you're leasing it at $1,000 a month and it's making $2,000 a month in profit or it decreases your cost by $2,000 a month, then in this business, you're going to get as many as possible as long as that equation stays profitable for you. And the prices that Tesla and others have mentioned for these humanoid robots I got to say, they're a lot less than I think a lot of us expected. Take a listen. How's the Optimus uh, project going? I remember we talked last, um, and you said this publicly, that it's in doing some light testing inside the factory. Um, yeah. So it's actually being useful. What's the build of materials and when, you know, for something like that at scale? So when you start making it like you're making the Model 3 now and there's a million of them coming off the factory line, what would, the, would they cost? Twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 you think? Yeah. I mean, what I mean, I've discovered that really that, you know, anything made in sufficient volume will asymptotically approach the cost of its, of its, uh, materials. So now there's, the, there's, I should say the, there's, it's, so some things are constrained by the cost of intellectual property and like paying for patents and stuff. So a lot of, you know, what, what's in a, a chip is like paying, paying royalties, um, and depreciation of the chip fab. So, but the actual marginal cost of the chips is very low. Um, so, so, so Optimus, it obviously is robot. It, it is, it weighs much less and is much smaller than a car. Um, so the, you could expect that in high volume, uh, and I'd say that you also probably need three, three production versions of Optimus. So you need to refine the design three, at least three major times. And, and then you need to scale production to sort of the million unit plus per year level. And I think at that point, the cost, the, the, the you know, the, the, the labor and materials on Optimus is probably not much more than $10,000. And that's a decade long journey. It, maybe? Basically think of it like the, the full cost less. So you didn't answer if that was a decade long journey, but if you think about it, let's assume for a second that it is, let's say in the year 2035, the cost of producing the third or fifth generation of this humanoid robot, whatever version we're on then, the cost of it is $10,000. So sort of the marginal cost, the cost of producing another one, right? Not counting the amount of money cost to build the technology, the production facilities, et cetera. Once you have all of that, the cost of producing plus one robot is $10,000. That seems like a completely world changing sort of event by that point, because Assuming there's enough of a production capability, that means there's going to be a lot of them. They're going to be inexpensive. They're going to be everywhere. It's very hard to even kind of project and predict what that world would even look like. As Brett Adcock, the founder of the Figure One robot, he's saying he believes that we're going to rapidly see a billion plus robots emerge. Not over the course of one year, but over time, each year, there will be more and more and more. And if we can assume they're like cars, maybe they have a 10, 15, 20 year lifespan. You can see how we can approach, let's say, a billion robots within a decade. Basically think of it like Optimus will cost less than um, a, a small car. Insane. So at, at scale volume with the three major iterations of technology, and so if a small car, you know, costs $25,000, you know, it's, it's probably like a, I don't know, $20,000 for, for an Optimus, for a humanoid robot that can be your, your body, like a combination of R2-D2 and C-3PO, but better. Um, I mean, you know, that's, that's the, and I, and honestly, I think people are going to get really attached to their humanoid robot because I mean, like you look at sort of watch Star Wars, there's like R2-D2 and C-3PO, I love those guys. I'm sure we all love one of them a lot more than the other, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, you know, they're awesome. Um, and the, their personality and, and I mean, and all R2 could do is just beep at you. And I just didn't even, yeah. speak English, um, and yeah. go to translate the beeps, you know, so you're well, in year two of that, if you did two or three years per iteration or something, it's a decade long journey for this to hit some sort of scale. And I, I would say mid major iterations are less than two years. So, um, it's probably on the order of five, five years. Wow. Uh, maybe, maybe six to get to a million units a year. And at that price point, everybody can afford one on yes. planet Earth. I mean, it's going to be that one-to-one, -one, two two-to-one. What do you think, ultimately, if we're sitting here in 30 years, the number of robots on the planet versus humans? Yeah, I think the number of robots will vastly exceed the number of humans. Vastly, yeah. Vastly exceed. I mean, you have to say, like, who, who would not want their robot buddy? Everyone wants a robot buddy. Um, you know, this is like, especially if it can, you know, you know, it can take care of your, your take your dog for a walk. It could, you know, mow, mow the lawn. 
it, it could watch your kids. Uh, it could, you know, like it could, it could teach your kids. It could, it could. I, for one, am very excited about having a robot in the house. I was talking to a female friend of mine who's a little bit on the shorter side, and I noticed that she was not at all excited about having this robot in the house, and I was trying to understand why. And she mentioned this thing that's kind of like obvious in the retrospect, but something that I didn't really think about at the time. They're saying if you're taller than the robot and you're kind of looking down on it, it's much smaller than you, it doesn't appear threatening. But imagine if that robot stood like a head and a half taller than you, all of a sudden that's a whole different picture. And I kind of like envisioned that in my head and I went, okay, I get it. If these robots would tower over me, I would not want one in the house for sure. It's just like a whole different dynamic there. You could also send it to Mars. Yeah, absolutely. So we can send a lot of robots to Mars to do the work needed to yeah. make it a colonized planet for you. Mars is already the robot planet. There's like a whole bunch of yeah. you know, robots, like rovers and only ro helicopter. Yes, only robots. That's true. That's inter so, interesting yeah. to think about. No, I, th I think the, the sort of useful humanoid robot opportunity is the single biggest opportunity ever. Because if you assume like, I mean, the, the, I think the ratio of humanoid robots to humans is going to be at least two to one, maybe three to one. Because everybody, everybody, everybody will want one, and then there'll be a bunch of robots that you don't see that are making goods and services. You think it's a general, one generalized robot that then learns how to do different tasks, or? Yeah, I mean, we, we are a generalized robot. Yeah, we're a general We're, we're just on robot. We're just made of meat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> meat puppet. We're, we're, yeah, I mean, operating my meat puppet, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, we are actually... And, and, and by the way, it, it turns out like as we're designing Optimus, we sort of learn more and more about why humans are shaped the way they're shaped and, you know, and why we have five fingers and why your little finger is smaller than, you know, your index finger, uh, you, know, you know, obviously why you have opposable thumbs, but also wh why, for example, your, the muscles, the, the major muscles that operate your hand are actually in your forearm and, and your fingers are primarily operated to the um, your, 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 the, the muscles that actuate your fingers um, are located, the vast majority of, the, of, the, of your finger strike is actually coming from your forearm. Um, and your fingers are being operated by tendons, little strings. That, that, that's, and so the current version of the Optimus hand uh, has the actuators in the hand and has only 11 degrees of freedom. So it can't, it's not as, it doesn't have all the degrees of freedom of human hand, which has, depending on how you count it, are roughly 25 degrees of freedom. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and it's also like not strong enough in certain ways because the actuators have to fit in the hand. Um, so the next generation Optimus hand, uh, which we have in prototype form, uh, the, the actuators have moved to the forearm, just like a human, and they operate the, the fingers th through cables, just like the human hand. And, uh, and, and, it, and then the next generation hand has 22 degrees of freedom, um, which we think is enough to do almost anything that a human can do. Um, and presumably, I, th I think it was written that X and Tesla may work together and, you know, provide services. But my immediate thought went to, oh, if you just provide a grok to the robot, then the robot has a personality and can process the voice and video. If you've ever asked grok to roast you and it's, you know, you have a Twitter slash X profile that has some stuff on it, right? It kind of goes through it and then roasts you based on your tweets and your activity and people you're following. I got to say, it's pretty good at that. So I think that's our future. Seven foot tall robots powered by Grok roasting the crap out of us all the time. Anyways, that's it for me today. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.